let's take an individual who is medically obese. Um, and let's take an individual who is, uh, and by the way, metabolically unhealthy, right? So that's the key point I want to get at here. So this is a person whose health is compromised by their weight, um, both from an orthopedic perspective and metabolically. And then let's take another individual who's overweight, but if you're looking at them objectively, you don't see the metabolic signs of overweight. They're not suffering um, physical and orthopedic issues associated with it. So both of these people, let's just assume, have a desire to lose weight. One of them to primarily ameliorate the medical conditions uh, and also the uh, mm -hmm. aesthetic conditions. And then the, 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 the latter person just for the aesthetic conversions, right? Um, okay. We, we probably look at those people differently. When I say we, I mean, society might mm -hmm. make a different moral judgment on those two. That's right. You're arguing that's a false dichotomy. I think it's, it's a, it's a legitimate dichotomy to see the situations as distinct situations, but not necessarily implying distinct recommendations coming from those. Let's, let's refine it to a two by two. Hmm. We've got people as, let's just say, four individuals come to you. And we're going to say that you're the objective, all-knowing agent. And Meaning I determine who g goes on the drug? No, you oh. determine their state of being. Got it. Right? Half of the people are objectively at medical, physical risk because of obesity and would be objectively medically helped by losing weight on this drug. Half of the people are not at objectively medical increased risk and would not be predicted to have a medical, a major medical benefit. Within that, each of those groups, yep. half of them think they have a medical problem, regardless of whether you objectively determine they <laughs> do, and think they would benefit. And half of them aren't interested in that. They want to do it for cosmetics, income, uh, other opportunities, et cetera, stigma reduction, quality of life. And the question is, how should those four groups be treated? Mm. Now, it seems to me, from an obvious point of view, if we're concerned about expense and the expense is borne by society, not the individual coming, or if there's shortages and we're going to take it away from someone who's genuinely medically needed, then going to the non-medically needy people is questionable. But if we get over those problems, if the person says, I can afford to pay it for it myself, and the availability is there, and we think there's no big safety problem, or even if there's some safety problem, but we've told them, yep. it's fully consented, take the libertarian view, it's their choice, it seems to me. Yeah, and I, it's hard to imagine any reasonable person could argue with that position. Well, one of the big statements that got in some news was a, uh, a very reputable um, entity, major player in mainstream medicine, who has an interest in actually promoting this. And a, a three sort of step statement was made. Step one is the drugs were intended and designed and studied for this use, meaning treatment of medically needy people. Second, the drugs were proved for that use. Third, therefore, they should only be used for that. And right. the third part is well, a moral judgment, that's not right. a factual judgment. So, so really, judgment. the first and the second are true, and what they really tell you is, therefore, the cost-benefit analysis has to be viewed through the lens of that patient population. In other words, when you ask the question about risk and benefit, you have to at least acknowledge that the long-term risk, long-term benefit are studied in that population. Correct. And as such, this is what the data are. These are the risks, these are the benefits, make your judgment. Conversely, if you ask the question, hey, for a person who is subjectively 10 pounds overweight, um, like me, <laughs> right? Well, you could argue I'm 10 pounds overweight, right? Nobody knows but me, basically. But hey, um, should I be taking this drug? So let's take an analogy. Patient comes to you. They're very wealthy. They're in good physical health. They have a house. They have a car. They have all the material things they need. They have a family. Family 
loves them, they don't engage in violence, and they'd say, I feel miserable, I'm anxious all the time, or I'm depressed all the time. You might say, after you might try a few things, explore it, but assume you've explored it, it's real, maybe you tried some cognitive behavioral therapy, didn't seem to work, you might say, yeah, an anti-anxiety drug or an antidepressant might be for you. FDA approves those things. We take the person's quality of life and their feelings into account. Why is it that the person who says, I feel too fat and I want to be 10 pounds thinner and look good in my bathing suit, or I want to get this job as the leading actor in that film, or I want a promotion in my environment and I think I'm more likely to get it if I'm thinner, mm -hmm. or I'm hungry all the time and I don't plan to lose weight, I just want to stop being hungry all the time. Why are those that person's feelings or non-medical desires any less valid than the person with depression? Or for that matter, the person with an unusual but not health damaging physical feature, you know, an unusual nose or something, who says, I just feel like I'd be judged better. I don't think it is. I guess the only thing I would suggest as the backstop to that is when the person who doesn't like their nose goes to the ENT surgeon or the plastic surgeon to have the completely non-essential but emotionally beneficial procedure, if they're seeing a good surgeon, the surgeon can tell them with unambiguous clarity what the probability of negative outcomes is. Right. And I think the same is true in the case you described at the outset about the individual with depression or anxiety. A very good physician can explain to them what the risks are. And by the way, as you know well, um, very few physicians would give you um, a medication for anxiety or depression without also prescribing in parallel to it psycho psychotherapy. The, the data are pretty mm -hmm. clear that medication by itself is nowhere near as effective as medication coupled with psychotherapy. So you have two things going for you that make this analogy not apples to apples, which is in the case of depression, we can say much more about the long-term side effects and we're combining it with a behavioral therapy that aims to improve the efficacy. Again, I'm not suggesting that the person who wants to lose 10 pounds um, doesn't have a legitimate concern. I, I think my concern is um, we don't know enough about the long-term risk to tell them for their relatively minor health compromise, um, is it potentially worth it? Is the trade-off worth it? I think we could probably say that with a higher degree of certainty for the individual with significant obesity. Because even if we would have kind of a small bracket of understanding the downside potentially of the drug, we really know the downside of having a BMI of 40. Right. Right. Like, you know, being insulin resistant, having type 2 diabetes, having a BMI of 40 uh, has such a clear downside that, you know, the other side of that bet is a pretty easy one to take. So I think that to me is the, if, so, so again, for me, it's not a moral question at all when I'm confronted with this question, which I am all the time, right? Every, mm -hmm. Every week, I probably, or every two weeks at least, interact with a patient who fits the exact description you're talking about, right? right. Which is, hey, I would just, I'd love for this to be easier. And, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting something to be easier. But my hope is we get to a point where we could give them the same degree of clarity around risk that the plastic surgeon can give the patient who, under, who wants to undergo a rhinoplasty. Right. And, and I agree with you on that. And I think that's where you get into the, the moral questions come in around how do you conceive of the role of FDA, society, physicians in regulating choices. And by the way, to be clear, that's why I'm not taking one of these drugs. Like, I'd love to be 10 pounds lighter. I would love to be 10 pounds lighter. I would love to never be hungry. Like, all of the things that these drugs do, by the way, they improve glycemic control. All of those things are appealing to me. But the truth of it is, for somebody who is quite a risk taker, and I am quite a risk taker, 
I've you seen are. it. I am. When it comes to my health, I would argue I'm quite a risk taker. But I've watched countless patients take these drugs. And as I've shared with you and others, without exception, the resting heart rate overnight goes up about 10 beats per yeah. minute. And I don't know what it is about that fact and the fact that heart rate variability goes down slightly that just has me asking the question, for me personally, is it worth a trade-off? Yeah. Do I really? Do, is there some underlying sympathetic, parasympathetic imbalance that results from this drug that is doing a whole bunch of other good things vis-a-vis -vis my appetite, potentially, but you know what? Over the arc of my life, is it worth it? And if it's, you know, maybe if it were 40 pounds and it was medically a problem, I'd say, oh, let's, I'll take the heart rate bump any day of the week. So informationally, I'm with you 100%. And, and in terms of the morality of the honest communication, I'm with you 100%. Well, by that, I mean, informationally, we have a fair bit of data that allowed FDA to make its decisions on the use of these drugs for particular indications in patients who are judged to be, quote unquote, medically needy of those drugs. And we don't have a lot of data on the person who's thin, but who says, I just want it to be easier, or the person who's thin, but says, I'd like to be 10 pounds thinner. Um, and I think anything, any treatment or provision of something to people without a full disclosure of what you know, and an honest disclosure is not right. So I think if I were in your shoes, I'm not a physician, I don't prescribe drugs, but if I were in your shoes and that person came to me, my bare minimum is that I've got to say to them, I want you to be aware that I have no data on this over many decades. We only have a few years. I want you to be aware that it was only tested thoroughly in these populations, which is not your population. And you need to know that there are, the, as Rumsfeld famously said, the unknown unknowns. Then I think there's an issue of choice. There are lots of things that I think it's acceptable that our society permits, but I don't personally want to do them. Think freedom of speech. I think it's perfectly acceptable and necessary that we allow certain people to come out publicly and make certain statements. But I'm not sure I want to make all those statements. Um, and I can imagine you saying, I think it may be acceptable that somebody provides this drug to this person under these circumstances, but that's not what I want my career or life to be. And, and I think you should have that choice. So I think these are things we ought to do. And it comes down very much, I think, to this sense of... Um, after we have the inputs, we can agree on the facts, right? or we should be able to agree on the facts. But then what we do with those facts, that becomes, we can disagree because we have different values. And I think that's where it's how much of a paternalist is one. The FDA is very paternalistic, right? They're going to decide which drugs are good for whom, or how much are you a libertarian, where you say, we'll tell you about the effects to the extent we can of this drug or this treatment, but how good it is, whether you should do it, whether you want to do it, implies values. And you make that decision as long as it's a fully informed decision. Um, and those are different views of how we should proceed. Mm -hmm.